Okay, so let's look at, ta uh, let's look at the tactical thing then. Okay, let's just take a quick look at tactical. So I need someone with a racket, not Larry. All right, so remember the squares, right? So what I want you to do is you're going to talk our way through these squares. What do I need to do technically to make the ball do this thing? Remember, you had to look at that. So this is our first square here. This is my first court I'm going to play on. All right, my first court is this line to this line. It's one quarter of the red court. If I get closer, is it easier or is it harder? Okay, it's a trick question. Because, what do I not have the closer I get to? Right, I don't have time. So when the people say it's easier, they're thinking about only the sending bit of it. But actually, if you're thinking about the reception bit of it, right, the fact is I don't have time to react. So there's a tipping point. If I go from here and I move backwards, the ball will do more different things, right? And my stroke needs to be more robust. If I go forwards, I get less time. So actually, this is the ideal starting point. It gives kids time to see the ball and start to react. So what do I have to do technically here, right? So you're, you're going to do the list. Here we go. What do I have to do technically to play tennis on this court? Out, one love to me. That was quite interesting, wasn't it? I need to do, all right? What do I need to do? Okay, talk to the person next to you. The only way I win a point on this court is keeping the ball in play more than the other person. Agreed? There's no direction, there's no speed, there's no spin, there's none of those factors. Technically, what do I have to do before I, not before I move, because I'm going to bounce this drill a little bit, but what do I have to be able to do? Go through it. Should, should it rattle it like that? Because this is the technical stuff. You're good at this. What do I have to do technically? Go. Tell the person next to you. No, no, you were doing absolutely fine what we're doing. You don't need to spin on this. It doesn't buy you anything. There's no benefit to it. What we want them to get is we want them to get a good impact point. We want them to get a little short swing. We want them to be on balance. Those are the things we're looking for. Tactically, well, yeah, because, because the first, interesting, the first thing you did was you did that, yeah? All right, so some really interesting things. That's it. Should be, you should know it straight away. Boom, like that. It's easy. The first thing he did was what? Huh? No, sorry, the first thing he did in the points was what? He missed, he hit the ball out. What did, the, did he do on the very next shot? He adjusted and how did he do that? He shortened his swing, all right? So, first of all, you need to say, okay, what, what he needs to make the ball go there. He, does he need this? So if you tell someone to follow through on this size court, you're making them worse. Have you ever seen Roger Federer hit this ball? Yeah, of course, if he wants the ball to go there, what other way is there to do it? Yeah? Like, when is this a really bad forehand? When I was aiming there, it's a terrible forehand. You see? So you have to start thinking about where you're trying to make the ball go, and everything technical goes back to our mission. I want to win, I'm a kid, right? Or at least I want to be successful. So what do I need? Little swing, what else do I need? Okay, talk technical now. You can talk technical now. Talk technical. I'm not, I'm not bad. Look, I'm being successful. No, I'm being successful as I am. Don't tell me things I already know. Okay. Yeah, good. Well done. All right. So look, this is the point. Yeah, the only way you win is by keeping the ball in, right? There's various dimensions to that, granted. But what we need is a good impact point. Really good impact point. Like that. Yeah? That will help us, to, not like this. I always tell the kids, we're going to hit the ball where you open the door. Because sometimes when you tell them to hit the ball out in the front and they've turned to the side, they go like that. Because they think that's out in front. I say, no, go up to the door and open the door, put your racket in there, right? Make sure you have an angle here. That's where we want to hit the ball. Make your strings point in the direction you want the ball to go. Simple as that, right? And most of the time that will do the fix. You don't, when you've told them get open the door, get many kids going like this, right? Or like this, unless they want to be James Bond. All right? So the reality is this is where they're going to hit the ball, right? They need this swing and they need to be on balance. Arrive, stop, hit. That's it. 
all right? That's it, that's all they need. And the same in the backhand. Whatever swing you want, by the way, there's no reason you can't teach one-handed backhands, don't be frightened, right? Especially if you think they're gonna be tall, right? There's loads of kids out there that can learn this as a one-handed backhand if they want to, right? Especially the boys. So the good thing about these balls is you can teach both. There's some great kids out there with one-handed backhands. It, there's no, before we get into that conversation, we're not going there today. There's no answer to the question, right? The Belgians, for example, have about 50-50 one-handed to two-handed backhands, boys and girls. Um, I wonder why, yeah? Because they just had one of the best one-handed female players in the world, you know? So it's not, you know, technically, if you, if you, if you go down the mechanics of it, it, it suggests that a one-handed backhand would be better with a taller person and a two-handed with a smaller person, but then, most of the top guys in the world are 6'3", and they're all using two-handed backhands, so, but you have the option. Let's just deal with that, all right? Okay, so you see how, if we want to be successful here, that's what we need with our swing. What do we need to be able to do with the ball in terms of judging the ball? By the way, you can sit down, you don't have to stand up. You want to sit down? Your legs might fall asleep. Right, what do I need to be able to judge with the ball? Tell me something about the ball flight. Okay, who's seen this? Who's seen this? You ready? Who's seen this? Who's seen that? Yeah? Okay. Huh? No, but I, what I'm doing, so what you see, it, what you've got to think about is there's various different characteristics of judging the ball. So when the ball comes, I work out where the ball's going to land. All right? Um, who's ever told a kid to watch the ball? Right? Yeah? This is what watching the ball looks like. <laughs> That's not what you meant. What you meant was assess the ball. All right? So actually I might do, for example, this. He might hit the ball, I might go, yeah? Try and clap the ball when it lands on the ground. If we want to make sure we're accurate, get rid of the racket. We might do the same. Ready, go. That was perfect. Okay? Yeah, I might catch the ball. I might get a cone or a baseball cap or something. Yeah, and as the ball comes over the net, I'm gonna catch the ball in it. Because if I have to catch the ball in something, I have to stay away from that bounce, which I was rushing before. See that? Yeah, so a lot of kids judge where it's gonna go here, but they don't calculate this bit, which is where they have problems. So how would we set this up in lessons? A Little bit of hitting. A little bit of catching in a cone, a little bit of hitting, a little bit of catching in the cone. No one's going to stand there catching the cone for 10 minutes, right? They're definitely going to complain up there. Bounce it backwards and forwards, yeah? And tell the kid, this is because you're getting too close to the ball. That's why we're doing it. Oh, okay. A little boy I had a few weeks ago just did it for a couple of minutes and he pulled the face and then he went, oh yeah, I get this. And then instantly we went back to it. He was in the right place almost every time, okay? So we're looking for balance between the sending skill, which you all identified straight away, and the receiving skill. And the, and the explanation is just really brief because they, they pick up on it without you explaining it. Yeah, and, and the explanation is easy because we're not doing that for 10 minutes. We're going hit, catch, hit, catch. So we're going backwards and forwards like that the whole time. So the natural variety goes by bouncing things backwards and forwards. An older age group, with the boys especially, will do cooperative drill, competitive drill, cooperative drill, competitive drill, cooperative drill, competitive drill. We don't leave all the points to the end. Because then the boys work out why they're doing the thing that they're doing. Why am I practicing cross-court forehands? Now we're going to play a game, see who's, you know, just cross-court forehand points. Okay. Then you go back to it again, and they go, yeah, yeah, I need to be better at this. Whereas if you leave all the points at the end, they don't realize why they're practicing the skill. Those of you that have had little kids, I'll tell you a real quick one about my daughter. I phoned her once, uh, sorry, I, she asked me once for a toy when she was six, and I said, yes, you can have the toy tomorrow. And she went absolutely ballistic. I went, I'm sure I said yes, but it wasn't the yes, it was the tomorrow, right? The tomorrow is a lifetime away, right? So, you've got to think about the time frame in a kid's world and how you might get back to competition quick with the boys. 
Yeah. Cooperative, competitive, cooperative, competitive. Go like that a little bit. Throw and catch, hit, throw and catch, hit, throw and catch. You know, so you're all the time doing that. Don't ever do a drill for more than 10 minutes. Right? You can come back to it. You can do a 10 and then go off and do five minutes of something else and then do 10 again and you will find that they improve way faster. It's called the small batteries principle with kids. Kids have small batteries. They switch off quickly, their bodies tire quickly, they lose focus quickly. But if you give them five minutes or 10 minutes of something else, they come back again. Is that right? Yeah? Okay, right. What changes now then? We're going here, we're going long line. Okay, what's changed? Yeah, so basically, if I've got that really good impact point, I've arrived on balance. The only thing I'm going to change now is this. But if I was actually going to play a point on this court, where would the space be? That's the court. Where's the space? Huh? The space is at the front. And actually, this is the other thing about learning. What would be really good is to practice this. We're going to go here. Okay, then after we've done that for a bit, we're going to go back here. Then we're going to come back here. Did you get the idea? There, 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 there. Now, but do you know why? Yeah, but why doing it like that? Very good, well done. All right, so if you don't know, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you, all right. Kids learn a lot of things through opposites. All right, just look up Richard Schmidt or Wolfgang Schellhorn or any of those kind of guys. If I say a word, so let's do a word, up, down, fast, slow, yeah, black, white, you know, cross court, down the line, short, deep. You instantly want to connect it to something in your brain. The more you do opposite skills, the more you connect that feeling we were talking about before and the more you record it and you find somewhere for it to exist in your head, right? It's why all little kids' books based on that kind of, you know, opposite principle to start with, right? So actually practicing that is more effective than just practicing one of them, all right? But don't believe me. <laughs> go try it. You have to go try it, all right? It's really interesting. It increases the feeling, it increases the stimulation, it makes the brain switch on and off a lot more and you'll get a lot more out of it a lot faster. Okay? If you're a solo coach, you get to try it a lot because you don't have to worry about what the guy on the next door is doing next to you. Right? So, so this also would help me learn with the spaces, wouldn't it? Because if I'm, if I'm playing on this court and I want to move him, I've got a long swing now. Also, I can change that to a short swing. See? Yeah? So now I can start learning about the space. So doing opposites in everything you do, it's a really good way of, so even if you want to do throwing, like throw to a cone over there, throw to a cone over there, throw short, throw deep, hit, you know. Um, do you know the, uh, the West German soccer team? Sorry, they're not West German anymore, they're just German, right? We might boycott the World Cup, by the way. All right, but... You know how they practice penalties? They're pretty good at penalties. They don't put the ball on the, the, um, the spot at all. They put the ball here, they put the ball there. They, they never put the ball on the penalty spot to practice their penalties. Right? And that way, yeah, they learn a robust skill. Yeah? And they're damn good at penalties. Much better than the English who always lose in the World Cup on penalties. Right? So. So basically, you have to start thinking about these principles if you want to make good little players. And sometimes just by bouncing it like that, and this is what sounds really weird, because actually what I'm saying is, if you wanted to learn topspin, hitting 20 topspins, 20 slices, 20 topspins, 20 slices, 20 topspins, 20 slices, is better than hitting 120 topspins. That doesn't sound logical. It doesn't make sense. Because in America, more is always better. <laughs> Bigger is always better. Okay? 
because I love America. I told you, it's British humour. No, 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 because you are a microcosm of the world. Because we do really love you, coach, honestly. All right. But you do have two obsessions, big and fast. But I do love you. And if I, if I didn't have a daughter, I would be living here tomorrow. I'll tell you that for free. All right. My favourite place in the world to come. All right. So it's just humour. All right. Okay. So you got the idea? You have to think about that. Right. Okay. What changes now when we go cross court? Okay, now we've got a lefty, it's going to change a little bit. Okay, where would my movement be? What's going to change my movement a little bit before? Yeah, so I'm going across my body a lot more. Yeah. So sometimes now, oh, see that on that one. Yeah, so on this court here, I always had time to go one, two. Yeah? One, two. On this court here now, sometimes I'm going to need to hit off this stance here like this. And that might also help me to start doing what? With my racket. If I'm like this a lot more. Yeah, go on, keep going. Keep going. Okay, let's play a little bit more. There we go. Yeah, exactly, because if... Why, why is my foot over there on my stance? Why is it there? Yeah, so, so the fact it's further away allows me to swing much, much more yeah, over a greater distance and accelerate the racket much more. So I'm on this foot naturally more. So now I can go this way. So if I start going cross court, if we just play cross court like this, and again, that's probably the must. And I've kind of... I've got a lefty, so it kind of doesn't work. But if you really want me to win, I should be able to make him go off the side of the court. So you can play the game, if you step in the green, you lose, that kind of game. And that will help you to, so that's the only purpose of topspin on a red court. Topspin creates angles. Topspin doesn't push the other guy back on a red court. Look at these things. You got it? Yeah? So. It, it's where you start creating angles. So if you teach, if you want to teach topspin in red, that's fine. But it's because you want the ball to leave the side of the court, which and it doesn't often happen in red. Which is why you can put a red court here, and you can put another red court here. You can put another red court here, and they don't often run across the other person's court. But you can't do that on orange so much because on orange you can create more width because you have more length. See that? So there is a purpose for teaching topspin on a red court when you go cross court. And then the last, so, so the last one of our shapes, you have to hit the ball here. I'm going to go there, 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 there. Yeah? Oh, cheeky. Oops. We're still on, are we? All right, okay. So that then creates a very interesting dynamic, doesn't it? Because it brings us into the first point at which we experience adversity. Because he has got a worse court to play on than I have. Yeah, you see, he's got a whole court. I only got to play on a little half court. And that's one of the principles that we want to start putting in place but we do it very quickly and we also do it through a little bit of luck. So one of the other things we might do is, um, for example, we might play a tie break, but before we play, we're gonna roll the dice. When we roll the dice, I got five, you got two, it's five, two. That's how the tie break starts. Yeah, so what you wanna try and do is start creating some, but it's luck, because the next time we roll the dice, he rolls a six, I roll a one. Now it's six, one. So we start doing this. Now, I don't know if to say this, coach, because I'm going to say about entitlement, right? But at the end of the day, you know, you do have a problem with entitlement, don't you? You do have a problem with these kids all think that, you know, they, every, they, they deserve these things, they deserve these things. Yeah, we have the same problem, right? All the modern societies in the world right now don't have very much adversity in them. 
So therefore people work less hard. I, I, one of the countries I'm working with at the moment is Serbia. And I said to him, okay, tell me the secret of Serbian tennis. We had a war. Basically the children of the, the top players right now, I mean they didn't, they never, Jankovic went to IMG, Ivanovic went to Switzerland, uh, Djokovic went to Germany. They all got sent to, only Tipsarovic stayed in, uh, in Serbia, right? They all went to different places. But they were, in the background of what was going on, they had a pretty traumatic thing going on. So they had some adversity. So one of the things we want to do if we genuinely want to create players is start to create some little bits of adversity. So roll the dice. Um, six rackets on the line find the one that's really broken and bendy and gone out of shape whack it out of shape a little bit more yeah make one with a broken string give them a 17 inch racket dip one in water so the grips all soggy you know find things as these kids get to play and they're a little bit more confident they can do some of these things find things to make things challenging laugh about it join in so you play with a broken string sometimes. You play with a 17 inch racket. You play with a wet racket. You do all these things as well, right? Um, because you want the kid to do, like if, someone, if I said to you, what is your best tennis result ever? Who's got a tennis result where they came back from, a, from being down? Yeah, who remembers that, right? Some people, I, like I was six one down in a second set tie break and I won the match. I was 19, I'm 46. I still remember that now, right? It's like, it's the ultimate victory, isn't it? When you're, when you're on the ropes and you come back. And that's the thing we're trying to get into these kids. But we can't do it because society's giving them everything. Yeah? If you're in Norway, I was in Norway the other day, three-year-olds on iPads, like this, while their brothers are playing tournaments. Then their iPhone 6 phones rings. They pick it up and go, you'll have to speak to my PA. And they pass it across to the nanny. It's like, what the hell's going on? Right? How are you going to create athletes from that? It's really tough. So we have to create these little adversity challenges and then we have to really enjoy them and make them really good fun. You see, that's really, really important in some of the things that we do. Okay, um, but they're simple to do. They're really simple to do, all right? We'll set, I've got, a, I've got a, an ebook. I'll send you some of the stuff on ebook as well. All right, we'll send you that as well. On that note, make sure if you haven't uh, put your email address on the list that you do so so that I can send you uh, the ebook and the other resources that Mike is going to make available. All right, we need to move on to serve, yeah? yeah? Is everybody all right on the baseline stuff so far? Yeah. yeah? There is a couple more tasks we might want to work on on reception. Um, just real quick, things like um, when I move back, I might want to do this drill a little bit. I know some of you might go shock horror. All right. Because remember I was rushing the ball before, so sometimes if the workout were to be, maybe my partner calls out one or two. He calls out one on this one, yeah? Two on this one, yeah? You want to get me moving like this, yeah? We've also done, a re we've done another reception drill already based on width. Which was that one? We did a, a reception drill based on width. He did it. This one, the kicking one, we always stopped the, that was a reception drill, yeah? We also did the throwing, you're right, the throwing things, that was all reception based. Remember, if you can't receive the ball, you can't play tennis. It's the most important thing. If you don't teach these things, you'll get people that play tennis like, yeah? You know that person that plays tennis in, with their backhand, like, they didn't choose that backhand. They didn't go, you know what, I've seen that one, Federer, I've seen Serena, but no, I'm going with this one. I think it's going to be the next big thing. It's rocking. They're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Cricket's not a sport, remember. It's just a pastime. All right? Okay. And now here's a positive for coach. The Amer Americans knew what to do with cricket. They turned it to baseball. Right. Okay. All right. It's not a sport. Don't ever play it. All right. It's just an excuse for the fans to get drunk. That's the only reason cricket exists. Right? Okay. But this is all about reception. Right? This is all about reception. Okay, so you have, to, you have to understand, if you're not in the right place, if you're only teaching the sending bit, you are not teaching tennis, you are teaching golf. <laughs> right? Yeah? Mike, to that point, is there any uh, 
resources that you can think of that emphasizes, you know, the sending and the uh, maybe some techniques and stuff like that? Is there a book? Is there a video? There's a lot in the ebook actually I'm sending you. Okay. There's quite a few. There's some other videos and stuff like that. We'll sort you I'm not sure what videos are on our website. I'll sort you out an access code for three months so you can go and have a look. How about that? Yeah? How much did you pay for this workshop? All right, you just got 30 bucks. All right, there you go. All right. No. We run into problem here all the time with the kids that hit the exact same swing all over the court. So that's why we Yeah. Big time. Yeah, it will work big time.